to reminiscence profile of a legend that left the physical world in 1972, the year I forayed into the domain of social cultural anthropology, not knowing that one day I would have the onerous responsibility of recollecting his memory and sharing it with young entrants into the discipline. There is possibly no better way to initiate young anthropologists into the discipline other than sharing a biography of the man who shaped and defined contours of what may truly be called as Indian anthropology and not anthropology in India. It was my hard luck that I never met the man who gave soul to Indian anthropology and its philosophy of humanism and equality that he inherited from his mentor, the great Mahatma Gandhi. Though I was fortunate to meet Shurajit Sinha, Andre Pite, B.K. Roy Berman and many more eminent scholars from varied disciplines who worked with him or under his guidance. I tried reading through some of his writings uh, with renewed rigor all the lectures that were presented in his memory at IGNCA. Profile portrait of the legend reveals that he was born on January 22, 1901 at Gopi Mohan Dattalin ba Bagh Bazar, Kolkata. He was a bright student and was equally successful in sports. His father perceived early that his son would grow up to be a famous man. But he lost his father only at the age of 17 and then immersed himself in the study of science at Scottish Church College, Calcutta. He then went to Presidency College in Calcutta and completed his graduation with geology honors in 1921 with the first division. S.C. Sinha, recollecting anecdotes about him, would say he was a born nationalist. At the age of 10, he would tell his mother that he would leave home and work for his country. Those were the years of colonial domination and rise of freedom movement. Bose responded to the clarion call of Mahatma Gandhi and left college to join non-cooperation movement. He went to Puri and settled there in a house that was earlier built by his father. The temple architecture of Puri inspired his intellect. It was here that Sir Ashutosh Mukherjee spotted him and guided him to join Calcutta University as the British did not control it. He was prevailed to do his master's in anthropology and I think that was our fortune. It was here that master of Indian anthropology started his trust, trust with the discipline. He completed his master's in the subject with distinction in the year 1925. In 1931, he was jailed for participating in the Salt Satyagraha movement, but his quest for learning and writing sustained him in C-class prison conditions. It was here that he completed his study of temple architecture of Odisha. After independence, he joined Anthropological Survey of India and in January 1959 asked Fraternity of Serving Anthropologists, irrespective of their specialization in social or physical anthropology or their official positions, to participate in a survey to map cultural traits in one or two villages in each district of the country. Within a short span of 15 months from October 1959 to March 1961, 311 out of a total of 322 districts and 430 villages were mapped to present a cultural profile of the communities living in these areas. This was published in a volume aptly titled 
Peasant Life in India, A Study of Indian Unity and Diversity in 1961. In 1925, a Professor Bose also went to study Joan tribe known for practicing shifting cultivation. Shurajit Sinha once again calls him a perpetual field observer. He always insisted on the importance of doing field work in anthropology and for bringing about innovative research methodologies. His philosophy was influenced not only by Gandhi, but also by Marx. And he observes, Marx or Kryptokin held a larger view of human uni unity that was justified by their surroundings. It was the same for Buddha or Christ as it has been with Gandhi in our times. It is the leadership of such men which seems to me to have been more responsible for the progress of civilization than any other single factor which one can think of. Bose had this in his mind when he researched later on in the discipline. Bose also articulated his personal philosophy by saying, and I quote, I shall prefer to continue to believe that the observed progress in human history, though it is not deep in quality, has been brought about by the operation of intelligent sympathy. And to this he added, Gandhi's plan of bringing about social change, not through punishment but by conversion, has a deep appeal for me and I believe it would be worthwhile to give it a fair trial on a large scale in a world now living under the shadow of war. This exhibits his true devotion to the philosophy of non-violence and giving equal opportunities to all. Quoting verbatim once again from Shirajit Sinha's first memorial lecture delivered in 1993 at IGNCA, he said, and I quote, Nirmal Bose used to be very sad and disturbed that in a vast, highly diversified country like India, Indian anthropologists have shown inadequate interest in making certain areas of research as their own on the basis of innovating appropriate methodological and conceptual tools for probing into social reality of the country. Sina added, Bose believed that corporate committed inquiry inspired by a concern for national development with particular focus on the conditions of the downtrodden people was bound to generate a spirit of serious research output. Today, when my generation sits back and introspect that why anthropological insights have not had the desired influence and in public policy, both observations haunt me. We lacked spirit of corporate committed inquiry. And we remain caged in our little pigeonholes, often reading and quoting texts that were neither discursive nor reflexive of the Indian reality. In a discussion held at Palo Alto, Stanford, USA, on 13th March 1958, in which Stalmers of the era, Redfield and Krober, along with Wright and Mendelbaum, participated. Both made some critical observations that are extremely relevant for anthropological understanding of contemporary situation almost 60 years later. Responding to dominant view that traditional villages were self-sufficient units, he remarked, in the 16th or even the 15th century, we don't really get any completely self-sufficient village as Prof. Professor Krober has pointed out, in some matters, yes, they are self-sufficient, in others, no. And to a question that asked, how do the nationalists stand in relation to orthodox people, Bose again replied, and I quote, nationalism was not merely expressing itself in literature, but in activity involving great risks and therefore even the orthodox would hesitate to say 
anything against these people because their heroism protected them against hostile criticism. Very wise words. If we do some introspection, we see this unfolding all around us. In 1961, in preface to ASI publication, Peasant Life in India, a study of Indian unity and diversity, both wrote, and I quote, there is more unity in India's variety than one is likely to admit at moments of forgetfulness. Unfortunately, we seem to be forgetting a lot more. A deep acquaintance with the facts of life is perhaps the best introduction to any form of social science. I am a strong votary of India's plural character and I have often con contested any imposition of notion of imagined construction of unity. But both words caution against obstinate dismissal of common characteristics that unify without any sense of oppression. With his background in geology, while working for a wider national cause, Bose kept collecting material on different temples in Odisha to write his first book titled Canons of Recent Architecture. Summarizing contributions of a stalwart like Nirmal Babu is a Herculean task. The best tribute that I read was given by famous economist P.C. Joshi when he told Shurajeta, Nirmal Babu was deeply interested in understanding the social reality of the caste system. In this matter, his intellectual concerns were enriched by his feelings for the poor. He was like a Renaissance person in whom there was a coordination of intellect, feeling and vision. His medium of communication was mainly oral, there he learned something from his intimate contact with the people and perhaps also from Gandhi's mode of communication. With these words, I pay my tribute 